Uncertainty can be pretty scary sometimes, can't it? Especially when you're facing a set of circumstances that are totally out of your control and you have absolutely no idea if the very thing that you fear the most is the thing that's going to happen to you next. You see, it's in times like those, it's in those times where the not knowing and the not being in control can be absolutely terrifying. I want to share a story with you this morning to just kind of get us rolling in that direction about what that's like. It's a story from my own life. It's actually a little dated now, but I can look back on it and, and kind of laugh about it because it's been 21 years ago, almost to the month since this actually happened. It's a little incident that occurred with America West. If you've lived in Phoenix long enough, you know about America West. And well, our nickname was America Worst, and this is kind of why. Okay, so. 21 years ago, I had just gotten engaged to my beautiful wife, Melissa, you know, love of my life. She said, yes, I was so excited. You know, everything is going to be great. We're planning this awesome wedding, got this beautiful life planned out and everything is perfect. The only thing that I had to complain about was that we were dating long distance. She was actually the cousin of my best friend. So she lived over here and I was still in California. I had not yet escaped with the rest of them, right? So, (laughs) yeah, you think it's bad here, move to Prescott, it's half its California license plates. But anyways, we were dating long distance. It's one of those things I said I would never do, but I did it anyway, she was totally worth it. But in order for us to see each other in this whole dating process, one of us had to fly back and forth, and I was a pastor, so I rarely got to do it. Most of the time it was her coming out there. She'd stay with her cousin, we'd have a great weekend, and then she'd go home and go back to work, and life goes on. Well, this one particular weekend, it was my turn to come out here. And I was really excited about it because we, like I said, we had just gotten engaged and everything was perfect. You know, we're just over the moon in love and it's all good. And I leave church and I grab my suitcase and I go down to the airport and, you know, it was back before 9-11, right? So you could just walk on an airplane. It was no big deal. Jump on the airplane. I'm sitting on the tarmac ready to go. And I literally have, I've flown this route dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times going from Ontario airport over here to Sky Harbor. I used to do it for work. It was part of the thing that I normally did. And um, so I knew what to expect. I knew the timing of the flight. I knew the planes I was going to sit in. I had my seat that I liked and everything was just normal, right? And we get on the the, the, the runway and it's finally our turn to take off and we blast off into the air. You know, I always love takeoff. But as soon as that airplane started going up, I knew that there was something seriously wrong with this thing. I mean, it felt like, or it sounded like the engine was either going to poop out or blow up or just fall off the airplane. It's like, and I was sure that our pilot was going to get us up in the air, do a U-turn and put that bucket of bolts back on the runway and we were going to get a different airplane. But no, my pilot was an overachiever. And he was obviously in a hurry because he took off, banked that thing around and we flew to Phoenix on that plane. The funny thing was is, the, we were flying so low, it's like you could like shake hands with people on Interstate 10 when you're flying along. Something was seriously wrong, but we just kept going. And about half of the plane realized that something was amiss, and they're all like, and about half were completely clueless. Ooh, eat, drink, and be merry, because today you die, right? We get all the way over to Phoenix, and I'm, you know, I'm being really spiritual. I'm a pastor, so I'm worrying. You know, just can't wait to get there. And we get over to Phoenix and finally, man, get this plane on the ground. We bank that big old turn and we start coming in. And I noticed that the angle, it just, like we were coming in steep. Because I I was used to how it would go, you know. And I look out the window and you can just see that it's like we're warbling. The plane's doing this. Coming in really steep. And I'm thinking, oh, this this is not good. And I'm starting to pray, right? Oh, And, uh, I'm looking at the buildings outside the window and they're getting closer and closer and closer. It's like almost there, almost there, almost there, almost there. And then all of a sudden, like the front of the plane goes up like this. Guy hits the gas, he pushes your back in your seat. My face is all, you know, pushing back. And we rock it up into there. And I was like, no, you're going the wrong way, dude. We need to be on the ground. <laughs> and he goes back around and uh, makes a second, you know, makes an excuse about how there was crowded on the runway or somewhere like no man the plane's gonna fall apart and we're making our second round and we we start warbling in again and I'm thinking man should I really be worried and I look up at the flight attendants because I figured they're gonna give me the best clue 
And they're both just like strapped in their chairs looking straight ahead and they're like sheet white. <laughs> and it's like, oh God. It's interesting how your prayers in those situations get really short. There's no pretense anymore. I wasn't praying in these priestly vestments and you're citing chapters and verses and stuff like that. It was just like, Jesus help, Jesus help, Jesus help. And I was sitting next to this little girl who was about 11 or 12, and she was flying alone. And as I'm praying, Jesus, help, Jesus, help, I feel this little tap on my leg, and I look over, and this little girl looks up to me, and she goes, Mister, are we going to be all right? And I looked at her, and I put a big old fake smile on my face and lied through my teeth (laughs) and said, Yeah, everything is just fine. And then I closed my eyes, Jesus, help, Jesus, help, (laughs) Jesus, help. And of course, drama, right? I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the runway and explode into flames and burn to death right in front of my fiance who's standing in the, the, the jetway there waiting for me to, to land. And, you know, we come in and like I said, we were coming in fast and steep. And when that plane hit the runway, it was the hardest hit I had ever took in an airplane. And I had flown a lot back then. I thought the wings were going to snap off this plane. They put the reverse thrusters on and thank God we arrive at the jetway a little fettered but safe and I walk off the jetway and there's my beautiful bride and she's smiling and she sees me and she goes what on earth happened to you it's like okay I'm done I learned a few things that day the first and most important was never ever ever fly America West (laughs) that's why they had the nickname America Worst and that's why they're not here anymore right so yeah never fly America West but more importantly than that I learned that like I said a minute ago when you're really in trouble, when things are really, truly uncertain and you don't know what's going to happen, our prayers get very short. All of the pretense is gone. There's no time for flowery words. We don't sit around and quote scripture and worry about how we're going to sound to the guy next to us. We just say what it is that we need Jesus to hear. Jesus, help. Jesus, help. And as we're coughing out those very, very short prayers, something else is going on inside of us that I noticed that day. Back behind the, kind of just behind our conscious thoughts, peeking out, kind of like the boogeyman from underneath the bed. You don't really want to look at him because then you know he's real, right? So you don't want to really pay attention to this question, but it's there. And you're just asking, do I really, really believe that Jesus is going to help me? Do I really believe that he'll actually reach out his hand and help me through this trial that I'm in? And you see, circumstances like those, they tear away that curtain over our heart and they expose the truth of the nature of our faith that we have in Jesus. They expose the true condition of the faith that we have in Christ. And you guys all know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? You know, maybe you were lucky enough to never fly America West Airlines. Maybe you've never had an experience in an airplane, but you've had other experiences. Maybe you're having them right now. Maybe you haven't noticed the world's been a bit of a mess lately. There's been a lot of stuff going on on top of all the other stuff that we have to deal with. I know plenty of people in my life who have suffered serious financial difficulties over the last year and a half. I know our ministry took a massive hit when they closed down California because a lot of our money comes out of California that supports what we do, and it just ended. My brother had invested 15 years into building a business. Boom, doors closed. Bank account draining. He had to sell everything he had and move to a different state to resuscitate his business so he didn't lose everything. That was stressful. Those were times of serious uncertainty. Maybe you can relate in some way. You know, if it isn't that, there's always health. You get the call back from the doctor to go get the test results, you know that's bad, right? And you walk in, they say, yeah, we found something. The words you don't want to hear and the uncertainty just wells up. Maybe it's relational problems. Somebody you love betrayed you or backstabbed you or just walked away and you have no idea what you're going to do. It doesn't matter what it is. There's a hundred different ways our world can blow up or spin out of control. And we find ourselves facing those circumstances that we don't have any control of. We have no idea what's going to go on next. We wonder if that bad thing that we fear the most is the thing that's going to hit us. And deep down inside, there is that question that's lurking in our mind. Do I really believe that Jesus will reach out his hand and help me. Do I really believe it? And see, in those times, 
the true condition of our heart is revealed to us. I know from my own experience, too often we find that our, our faith is fragile, our faith is, is a little bit weak, and it's just plain ineffective to sustain us amidst the trying, uncertain circumstances that we're facing. So the question that's left in front of us is, how on earth are we supposed to grow our faith? How is our faith supposed to mature so that we can get to the place where it's just really, literally unshakable, that no circumstance can knock us down, that no uncertainty can send us tumbling into despair and fear? Well, that's what I want to answer today because Jesus gave us an answer through a little incident that occurred out on the Sea of Galilee a long, long time ago. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide. I'm, I'm an old guy, so I'm a low-tech preacher, right? We have to actually use our, our Bibles. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. As you're looking for it, I want to give you the background of what was going on right before this little passage. Jesus was with his disciples. They were doing the ministry that he had invited them into and was preparing them to take over when he left. They were up near a city called Bethsaida, which is at the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus was doing as usual. He's preaching the gospel to the crowds. He's healing their sick. And he's been doing it all day long. And when evening came, everybody was hungry. And there was a big crowd there. This was the 5,000 men with all the women and children to boot. There was no fast food places around. There was no DoorDash or Grubhub or anything to bring it out for him. So the disciples started asking, what are we going to do? These people need to eat. I'm sure they were hungry too. So Jesus elected to take care of the problem. He didn't do it by bringing out food trucks, but he did decide to do it by performing a miracle. It was a miracle in which he invited his disciples to participate, and he used five loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000 men in addition to all the women and all the children that were there with him. And his disciples got to take part in that by passing it out. And then immediately after that, this is what Jesus says, and immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And after he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already many stadia away from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were frightened, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me! And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's Son. Now essentially what we see in this passage is what is, in my opinion, one of Jesus' finest lessons on faith. But in order to fully appreciate this lesson that Jesus delivered, there's a few details that we need to bring to our attention. And the first one is that we've got to remember that Jesus is God in the flesh. He knew exactly what the best way was to disciple his followers. He knew what the best way was to develop every part of their relationship with him, including their faith in him. There was no guessing involved. He wasn't on a learning curve. He already had it figured out. He knew how to do it. And the great thing is, is he didn't have to depend on anybody else for his success or to pull it off. There was no chance involved. Jesus never rolled with the punches. Everything that he did, he did completely on purpose. So immediately after feeding the 5,000, he instructs his disciples to get into a fishing boat, one of the normal, regular fishing boats that they would have used back then. And he told them to go across the sea. Now remember, they were in Bethsaida. He told them to go to Gennesaret, which was depending on the, where you were leaving from and where you were going and the route you took. is about 8 to 10 miles tops. That's a long way to row a boat, though, right? This isn't a cruise ferry. It's a fishing boat. And it's the end of the day. And when he sent them out, 
He already knew there was going to be a storm. There was always storms on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus didn't need a weather app. He was God. And he knew the storm was going to be a bad one. And he knew when they got out there and they got into the storm that they were going to be afraid. And he knew when they were out there and afraid that he was going to walk to them on the water. And he knew that when Peter saw him, when the others saw him, that they would be afraid. They would think he's a ghost and they would cry out in fear. He knew that Peter would want to get out of the boat. He knew that he would walk for a little while. He knew that Peter would sink. And most importantly, he already knew what he was going to do in response to Peter's request. All before he opened his mouth. So Jesus tells him to get in the boat, go to Gennesaret. They get in the boat and they row out to sea. These are experienced fishermen. It's going to be a long night, but they're strong enough to make it, right? They row out on the sea. Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray. He's praying. They're rowing, and the storm comes. Jesus keeps praying. They keep rowing. Storm gets worse. Jesus prays. They row. Jesus prays. They row, and it gets worse. I don't know if you've ever been out in the ocean in a small boat before. I've done it once. When the weather got bad, it is not fun. It's like my second thing to the whole America West story. I couldn't wait to get my feet on dry ground after that. We just went out to go fishing. That's what these guys were in. Jesus is praying. They're rowing. It gets later. Finally, it's the fourth watch. So it's about between three and six in the morning. And the disciples are just being beaten up by this nasty storm. And in the midst of the storm, here comes Jesus walking on the water. And they react exactly like he expected. They were terrified. They thought he was a ghost. Because why wouldn't you? Nobody ever walked on the water before. This story wasn't familiar to them. They didn't grow up with it like we did. I mean, seriously, if you've been a Christian for 10 minutes or even been alive for 10 minutes, you've heard about the whole walking on the water thing. They didn't have that. They weren't expecting to see Jesus walking. If they saw him anywhere, they figured he'd be in a boat. So they look and they're terrified. They thought he was a ghost. Two important things to note about how they reacted. Like I said, they were very afraid. But in the midst of that fear, second thing, we have to look at Peter's response, especially when Jesus told them, it is I, don't be afraid. See, I don't know if this is what I would have done if I was in the boat. I'd be hanging on. Get me out of here. Jesus, help. Jesus, help. You know, it's like I was on the airplane. But no, Peter doesn't do that. He decides that he would feel safer out in the middle of the storm with Jesus on the water than he would in the boat with his friends. So he says, Lord, command me to come to you on the water. In other words, Peter asks to participate in yet another miracle. I've heard a lot of people go back and forth about, you know, Peter's choice to do this and was it right, was it wrong, da, da, da. You know, was he being presumptuous, was he arrogant, all, all this other stuff. It's like, I actually don't think so. I think that this was really not out of line for Peter to ask. Because you've got to remember, he had just participated in this pretty incredible miracle a few hours before He got to pass the bread and the fish as Jesus made five loaves and two fishes feed well over 5,000 people. So now he sees another miracle. Circumstances are out of his control. He's fearing that the thing that he wants to avoid most, i.e. death, is probably the thing that's going to happen to him if they don't get out of there. So he says, Lord, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And Peter gets out. You know the story. He walks on the water. He sees Jesus, but the circumstances just become so overwhelming that he starts to sink. And then he coughs out one of those short prayers, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches out his hand, saves Peter's life, and then Jesus delivers the lesson on faith. He says, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt If I could be so presumptuous to finish the thought there. He said, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt that I would help you? That's a loaded question for Peter. It's a loaded question for you and I. And Jesus' point here is simple. It's really, really simple. And it's also incredibly important. It's crucial to Jesus' growing relation or Peter's growing relationship with Jesus 
It's crucial to our growing relationship with Jesus. Jesus' point is simple. It's that Peter's faith was little. It was ineffective. It was not strong enough to sustain him amidst the massive uncertainty that he was facing in the midst of these circumstances that he couldn't control. And Jesus knew it. And Jesus' goal was to fix that, to facilitate his growth and your growth and my growth so that it can become mature. In Peter's case, to become so strong that he could be crucified upside down without ever denying Jesus again. Jesus wanted to grow Peter's faith. You notice that Jesus never busted Peter's chops for wanting to get out of the boat. That, that didn't even come up. Jesus didn't give Peter any flack for wanting to participate in another miracle. And he certainly didn't look at Peter and tell him he had no faith. Instead, Jesus calls Peter out on the fact that the faith that he does have is little. It's ineffective. It was not strong enough to sustain sustain him in the midst of the uncertainty. So the thing that Jesus wants Peter to learn here is how to grow his faith. And I'm going to show you how that lesson plays out here. But in order to fully appreciate what Jesus is delivering, there's a couple of observations that I want to make next. One, so that we appreciate the value of the lesson, and two, so we can understand exactly what the goal is that Jesus wants him to get to. First observation, Jesus is addressing Peter's faith because faith is absolutely central to our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've been a Christian any time at all, you probably already know this or you've intuited it. But yeah, just a couple of verses to prove it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For we are, saved, we are saved by grace through faith, and this is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. We are saved by grace through faith. Faith is how we, we receive our salvation and step into that relationship with Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live now in the body, I live by Christ, the Son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. So we're not only saved by grace through faith, but then we live by grace through faith. And in Hebrews eleven six, without faith it's impossible to please God. Faith is absolutely central to the Christian life. So it is no wonder then that Jesus chose to address Peter's faith and indirectly all the other disciples' faith all the way down the line, including you and me. He wants it to grow. Second observation, we need to point out that the faith that Jesus intends to build in Peter and that he intends to build in you and I is not just some warm feeling in our tummy. It's not some blind hope that we have to kind of scratch out and just uh, believe that something good is going to happen. That's TV faith. You ever see faith explained on TV? It makes you vomit. It's so far off from what Jesus is talking about. It's blind, it's this, it's a feeling, it's that. No, that's not biblical faith. That's not what Jesus is trying to build in Peter. It's not what he wants to build in you and me. He wants to build a faith that is a confident assurance that God will be and do everything that he said he would be and do in Scripture. It's a faith that is built on the person, the word, and the works of Jesus Christ. Confident assurance built on the foundation of the person, word, and works of Jesus. I want to give you a little example, a good way to remember this, because it's, I, I think it'll click when you see the picture. Let's just pretend that you're a movie buff. Well, maybe we don't have to pretend. I, I know your pastor is. <laughs> you like the Marvel things? Black Widow's out right now, right, isn't it? Didn't Black Widow just release last week? Let's just say that you got a really kind father, and he goes out because he knows you're a movie buff, and, and he buys you a ticket. Paid in full, no problem, ticket in hand. Brings the ticket to you and hands it to you, free. Here you go. And on the ticket, you look at it, it has the name of your local theater. It has Black Widow, 5.30 p.m. Sunday, whatever the date is today, 18th, I think. And then seat G1. 
Now, you're excited. Five o'clock finally rolls around. You grab your snacks and you stick them in your coat because that's what we do, right? Hide them. And then you're walking up to the theater and you got your ticket and you know you're going to get in, right? Because you've done it a hundred times. It says right on the ticket, here's the theater, here's the show, here's the time, and here's my seat. And you walk up to the attendant and you hand the ticket and he lets you in, right? So when you're walking towards the door of the theater, you have a confident assurance that what, says, what it says on that ticket is exactly what you're going to get. You get to go in, you get to sit down in your seat, G1, and watch Black Widow starting at 5.30 on Sunday. Confident assurance. Can you imagine how silly you would feel or how silly you would look in front of your, your friends if you got into the parking lot, you had your ticket, and you were freaking out on the way up there about whether or not the guy was going to let you in. Get it? That ticket is like the Word of God. It's a promise. Everything that he said he was going to do, he will do. Everything that he said he will be for you, he will be. It's in black and white. It's bought and paid for. It's irrevocable. You have your seat in heaven and you have his help on earth. Confident assurance. So no matter what circumstance you're facing, whether you're in an airplane or in a boat or amidst one of these other trials that come, whatever it says on the ticket in the word is exactly what you're going to get. Confident assurance in the person, the word, and the work of Jesus Christ, that he will be and do exactly what he said he will be and do in his word. When Jesus said, oh, you of little faith, that's the kind of faith he was talking about. Peter, you don't have that confident assurance yet. It's still shaky, and it needs to get better. So here's the lesson on faith that Jesus was teaching Peter that night in the storm. Two parts to it, really. One, his faith was ineffective, and that's understandable. You know, Jesus never beat Peter up for that, and I doubt he ever beats you and I up. If anybody's beating you up about it, it ain't Jesus. He points out that his faith is, in, is ineffective, but we all have to start somewhere, right? Peter had to grow, just like you and I have to grow. The, the problem is not that our faith is fragile sometimes. The problem is if we choose to stay there. It's not okay to stay there. Jesus wants us to grow into a mature, unshakable faith. And the second thing, real biblical faith, mature faith, faith that is effective to withstand any circumstance that life throws at us is only built when we are in the midst of those uncertain circumstances and we choose to obey what it says in God's word. It's like walking up to the doorway of the theater. Literally, if you spend your whole life in the theater or the parking lot worrying about whether or not you'll get in and you never go to the door, you'll never see it work. If in the midst of those uncertain circumstances we never engage in that perceived risk of being obedient to God, we'll never see him work it out or we'll always be wondering if it was him or if it was something else. There's a really easy way to remember how this whole process works that Jesus is laying out here. Truth plus experience equals faith. We have God's truth. That's what's written on the ticket, right? The word of God. When we act on it in the midst of the, the difficult circumstances, we see God work. We see him actually do what the promise it is that we're believing him for that he gave us in his word. And our faith is built. And it doesn't go from no faith to faith hall of fame. It's a process. That was the process that Peter was in. That's the process that you and I are in. There's a beautiful illustration that, that really kind of helps us visualize this, and it's the illustration of a bridge over a deep chasm. You see, when Peter was in the water, he was on one side of the chasm. He was going down, and his life was about a couple minutes from running out, unless Jesus did something. And he couldn't change the circumstances, just like you and I can't change ours. I couldn't make that airplane any safer I was in. I was stuck. Peter was stuck. You and I have all been stuck. 
And on the other side of the chasm, that's the place we need to get to. That's safety. That's the provision. That's the solution to the problem, whatever it is that we're facing. And the only way to get from one side to the other is the word of God. That's the bridge. The promises he makes, the things that he says he'll do and be for us. That's the foundation of the bridge. But every single time we find ourselves in those circumstances, it's scary to put your foot on the bridge, isn't it? It's like, ah, it's my first time. I don't know if it's going to hold. Should I risk it? And then we step out, and God proves faithful, and our faith grows. And then it happens again, and it's scary again. And we step out on the bridge, and we wonder if God's changed, maybe. Maybe the bridge is going to fall this time. But we go out anyways, and God provides. Just like the song said, he's faithful. He's faithful. I'm going to see a victory. And he does it. God pulls rabbits out of hats. I've watched him do it over and over and over and over and over again. And every time we cross that bridge by doing, acting on God's word, our faith is built and it's built and it's built and it's built. And maybe one of these days we end up one of those people with a really mature faith, a faith that's unshakable. That's where God wants us to be. That's the path that he wants us on. Now, like I said, there, there, there's a lot of ways that, cause this, that this can play out in our life, friends. And I don't wish any of these circumstances on anybody in here, but they come to all of us. But the takeaway is God never fails. Take some time to learn his promises. Take some time to look into to what he said he was going to do for you. And I would strongly encourage you when you hit those uncertain circumstances and you're praying that prayer, coughing it up, Jesus, help, Jesus, help, Lord, save me, Lord, save me. Take him at his word. He never, ever, ever fails. Would you bow your heads with me, please?